This is the Pasco ME6825 Mini Launcher. It's a pretty good device. I mean, it takes a little ball like this. Uh, you push it in right here, and you can put it at different range settings. And then when you pull this out, it shoots the ball out. Uh, it's super useful in projectile motion physics labs. Uh, and one of the things that I have my students do is to determine to measure the velocity of the ball as it comes out of here. Now, what I love about that is there are so many different ways that you can do this. And I'm going to go over all the, not all, most of the different ways that you could find the velocity of this as it comes out of the launcher. Okay, so how about a brief uh, projectile motion review? So if I have a, um, a launcher and I shoot some ball with the velocity V0 at some angle theta above the hor horizontal, then once it leaves that launcher, and until it hits the ground, wherever that may be, this whole path, the only force acting on it is the gravitational force. That means that the acceleration in the x direction is 0 meters per second squared. The acceleration in the y direction is negative g meters per second squared, where g is 9.8 meters per, no, negative g. The meters per second squared is in there. And, and we call g the, the magnitude of the gravitational field vector, so that's why it's negative. The y component is negative. But when we just write g without the vector over it, then it's just 9.8, it's a magnitude. I know people don't like that, okay, but that's the truth. So if that's the case, then one of the great things about projectile motion is the motion in the x direction and the motion in the y direction are independent. So in the x direction, I can write the following. I could say, uh, I'm sorry, x2 equals x1 plus vx delta t, right, where x is the x velocity. Uh, I can also say this, if I launch it at some angle v0 with some angle theta, vx is going to be v0 cosine theta, vy1 is v0 sine theta. So this one has a 1 next to it because the y velocity, since it has an acceleration, is going to change. But the x velocity is not, so I just say vx. It doesn't really matter if it's initial or final or whatever, it's always the same. So that's really the only equation that you need in the x direction um, because it's moving at a constant velocity. In the y direction, we have uh, a few more. I can write this equation, y2 equals y1 plus vy1 delta t plus minus, minus 1 half g delta t squared. I was getting a little, I was getting a little worried because I was running out of room there. Maybe it stressed me out. That's why I made that mistake. Okay. That's your kinematic equation for the motion in one dimension for a constant acceleration of negative g. I also have this v y 2 equals v y 1 minus g delta t. That just comes from the definition of acceleration. And then finally have this uh, v y to squared equals v y one squared minus two g delta y. That's the kinematic equation that doesn't have time in it. Okay. So in tip, typically, if I solve this for time, I can plug it in over here for time. The times are the same for those two. Okay, that was projectile motion. Let's do the uh, this a couple of different ways. And I challenge you to come up with your own creative ways to launch the ball. This is the one that, that I like because I think students kind of understand it, even though it may be not the best. So let's say I take this launcher and I launch it completely horizontal off a table. So this is y1, this is called that h, height h. So that means that y1 is going to be h. And we're going to find out where it hits down the ground. Y2 is equal to 0 meters. And then suppose I measure this distance, x. I shouldn't really call it x, but I did. Well, since the velocity, since the ball is launched horizontally, Vx equals V0 cosine of 0 equals V0. Since I launched it completely horizontal, the launch velocity is the x velocity. Of course, you could also say vy1 equals v0 sine of 
0 equals 0. So the initial y velocity is 0, but the total x velocity is v0. So what if I shoot it and then I get this? This is my stopwatch. Is that a stopwatch? Looks like a stopwatch. It is. Okay, I'm sorry, wait. There. And I time, I with my I just use a timer. I shoot it, I start the stopwatch, I stop it when it gets there, I measure this distance. I could say v0 equals delta x over delta t. Let's call that s. That makes more sense. That's just gonna be s over delta t. So you measure this. Now one of the things that I encourage students to do is to get a launch velocity with uncertainty. So this would be, let's say, v0 equals 3.2 plus or minus 0.1 meter per second. And so how do you get that in this case? Well, I could launch this multiple times. I could do this five times. I could get five different times and measure the times. I could get five different distances. And then I could find the standard deviation such that uh, delta s is a standard deviation. And then delta delta t, I know that's silly, is a standard deviation. Okay, so that's, that's what I would have my students do um, to calculate the uncertainty. But this is such an easy one. You just shoot it horizontally. It's all I care about is the x direction. I measure the distance. I, I measure the time. Boom, done. Okay, let's shoot it uh, straight up. I'm going to save the best method for last because no one likes it. Okay, so I shoot the ball straight up. Now, what if I measure, let's do it this way. What if I measure the time, delta t, to the highest point? So I just use a stopwatch. I shoot it straight up, and then as soon as the ball leaves, I start the stopwatch. As soon as it gets to the highest point, I stop it. Now, it's kind of hard to tell exactly where that is. However, I can say negative g is delta v over delta t. So I know the acceleration is negative g, which is 9.8, and this is going to be v2 minus v1 over delta t, but I know, what del I know what v2 is. v2 at the highest point is 0 meters per second. So that means that term is 0. Now I can solve for v1, which is the initial velocity. So v1 equals g delta t, the negative signs cancel. So I just measure that one time interval, and I can use that to calculate the velocity that it started with. And again, you could do that five times. Okay. What if I measure, what if I take the time it takes to go up and back down to the same height? What if I want to get to the same height? Well, here I can use an important thing. I can say v2 equals negative v1. If it's moving up with some velocity v1, when it gets back to that same height, it's going in the negative direction. So I can use that same equation. I could say negative g equals negative v1 minus v, v1 over delta t, and then I could, this is going to be equal to negative 2 v1 over delta t, so then v1 is g delta t over 2. So notice this is the time to highest, this is the time back down, time up and down. So they're different, okay? And the, what's nicer about this one is it's a longer time, right? So you have a longer time to record that thing. Now, what's not nice is you kind of have to eyeball where when it gets back to the same location. I mean, I guess you could put a little plate there or something and measure um, so that it hits that and it stops it. That, that would work. Okay, now what if I... So you see I've already got... That's three methods, right? This is number two. This is number three. Uh, what if I do this? What if I measure the height that it goes? So I shoot it, I measure the height and the time. So measure, I can't spell, h and delta t. Well, in that case, I can again use this thing, right? I can use the definition of average velocity, not that one. I can say v average is v1 plus v2 over 2 equals delta y over delta t. So if I measure delta y, which is h, and I measure delta t, I get the average velocity. And up here, the average, the velocity at the end is 0. So I could say uh, v1 over 2 equals h over delta t. So v1 equals 2h over delta t. 
Okay, now again, I could do a variation of this, number five. What if I um, measure the height? Well, no, that wouldn't be, I, I would just do it that way. Okay, well, I can still measure the height. I can get it from just measuring the height and using this equation, v y two squared, I'm just calling these, I left off the y's because it's in the y direction. So v two squared equals v one squared uh, minus two g delta y. That's one of the kinematic equations. Well, if I measure just the height, I can get uh, the final velocity v two is zero. So I can just solve this for v1. I get v1 equals the square root of 2g, and delta y is going to be h. Okay, so we're rolling right along here. I mean, if you, you can't use the, the, the height that takes to go up and back down because then you'd have delta y is 0, right? It starts in the same spot, and v1 equals v2, and that's how I got this thing up here. This one's not bad because you're only measuring one thing. But it is bad in that you, it's hard to measure exactly how high it goes. You know, you can kind of just hold a meter stick there and just kind of eyeball it, right? So here's my meter stick. And then say, okay, I think I know where it is. But then do it multiple times to get an average velocity and an uncertainty that way. Okay, uh, I'm going to do one last time. Number six. So this is, the, this is the best way. I saved the best for last. And I think there are are a couple of other ways. I'm gonna take the launcher and shoot it horizontally and hit the ground. It has to be horizontal. So it, it has a height of h and this travels a distance of s. And I can, I can measure where it hits. Uh, I use carbon paper. So I put carbon paper on the ground and then so there's a piece of carbon paper like this and then I put a normal sheet of paper over it and then when the ball hits, it'll, oh I'm sorry, reverse that. Uh, the carbon paper is on top. It'll leave a mark on the paper, and you can measure that mark and know where it hit. Um, sort of like the, the sand sand in um, the Olympic long jump. Yeah. Okay, so now this has a velocity, I'll call that V1, going that way. So in the x direction, I have this. Uh, x2 equals x1 plus V1 delta T. And so x2 is going to be S. S, x1 is 0, so I get S equals V1 delta T. So I can solve that for V1. It's going to be S over delta T. Now I need to get delta T, so I can use the Y equation. Y2 equals Y1 plus Vy1 delta T minus 1 half G delta T squared. So in this case, it's going to start at y1 is equal to h and end at y2 is equal to 0. So I get 0 equals h. And the initial y velocity, since I shot it completely horizontal, is 0. So that's going to be plus 0 delta t minus 1 half g delta t squared. So now I can add del this to both sides. I get 1 half g delta t squared equals h. Multiply both sides by 2, divide by g. Delta t squared equals 2h over g. Delta t equals the square root of 2h over g. Now I can plug that in over here. So that means I have v1 equals s times the square root. And I'm dividing by all this. So it's going to be the square root of g over 2h. Okay, and that's my velocity. Now the great thing about this, I use the, the, Excel, the g, 9.8. But then these two distances... I can measure in whenever I want. I can just measure them in my own leisure, right? I can take a meter stick right here and measure the height that it starts at. I can measure this distance, and I, there's still going to be an uncertainty in both S and H, but um, they're, they're easier to measure. So I'd probably have a lower uncertainty in this height rather than shooting it straighten up and measuring the, the uncertainty in that height, right, as it just in at an instant. Okay, let's think of just some other creative ways. What if I what if I shot this at an angle? Could you do it at an angle? Absolutely, you could. But then this term is not going to be zero, and you're going to have to use a quadratic equation to get delta t. So I would say don't do that. Okay. Um, okay. Now let's just think of some other interesting things that you could do, because I like interesting things, creative. Um, you could, you know, what if you had this? Could you use a motion detector and get 
That's sound. The motion detector we've used before, could you use that to get the velocity of this? I actually don't know. I don't know that it would work too well, but you could try it. Um, it might work better if you did something like this. Launch it straight up with the motion detector looking down. That might give a better reading uh, than at least initial velocity. I'm really not sure. Again, you could do something like this. You could use uh, creative photo gates. And if you know the distance between these and have, if the ball can pass right through that sensor, you might have to lower that one down a little bit. If you know the horizontal distance, you can get the time from these two. It's the same as what you did before with the timer. It's just a more accurate version. And then you'd have to get the, the distance from those two. Um, so I, those are the ones I'm thinking of right now, but I, there are probably some other ways to measure that too. So, but that's how you determine the launch velocity of the Pasco ME682 Mini Launcher. There's a larger version too, um, but you know. The other thing that while I'm, I'm thinking about this is does, how consistent is the launch velocity? That's a really great question. Does this launch the same velocity every single time? I don't know. That'd be a great lab experiment for you. Another really great lab experiment is what happens to the launch velocity as I in increase the launch angle. This is fairly constant, I'm pretty sure, but technically it should change because as the spring pushes it up, there's a change in gravitational potential energy for the ball and it would actually go slower as you shoot it up rather than horizontally. But can you detect that? Okay, and you could use that to measure how much uh, change in energy there is in the spring. I don't know. It's a question for you. Okay, but that's enough to get you started and to calculate your launch velocity.